you so much, Alan, for the introduction. Uh, it's actually a pleasure being here. My talk today is definitely a motivational talk. Uh, today is February 15th. There's a huge proposal due for me. I've been working on it day and night for three weeks. And you're wondering at one in the morning, why on earth am I doing this? Why do my kids ask me, oh, mommy, I haven't seen you in a while. And so I, I'm doing this stuff for myself more than anything. But uh, hopefully, it will give you some inspiration about, about why wind energy is actually important. The talk will be pretty straightforward. I would say half of it will be about not my work. So it will be about these issues such as carbon cycle, fossil fuels, and the very cool Kaya equation, which I really love to talk about. And then the last three are about my work. Um, uh, there's an interesting uh, concept we're, we're exploring about extracting kinetic energy from the atmosphere via wind turbines. And that has consequences on climate. And we, it turns out it also has consequences on hurricanes. So I'm going to show you some very preliminary results on that. And hopefully I will have some time to talk to you about airborne wind energy and show you some clips because it's a very cool new wind energy technology that uh, I'm supporting and I hope that uh, will take off in the future. So I found this very nice picture about the carbon cycle, which is my motivation number one. And uh, I'm an engineer and I like to boil down to the numbers. So this is pretty and all, but uh, this is a truly simplified carbon cycle to me. So that one was pretty. This is down to the, to the important components, which is, oh, you can't read this very well, but uh, I'm, I'm dividing the four reservoirs of carbon that are on Earth. These are the rocks uh, which contain the most carbon of all. Obviously, this would be so big that uh, it's not in, in scale because it's gigantic. Then we have the oceans, the oceans with about 40,000 gigatons of carbon. So giga, uh, 10 to the 9, we're talking about billions of tons of carbon. And we have about 2,000 of them in the, biota, in the soil and the biota. And then our best friend, the atmosphere. Um, there we have about 390 ppms of CO2. This is the number that I have to update every time I give a talk because it continues going up. Actually, it's 395 as of yesterday. I didn't have time to update it. But it corresponds to about 819 gigatons of carbon. So this is the, the carbon uh, reservoirs on Earth. And they interact with one another. And uh, these are the main interactions. The important one is the red one. This is us. This is fossil fuel burning. This is humans, uh, human flux. Effectively, it's a flux of carbon from the ground to the atmosphere. And it's been calculated at about 8 gigatons of carbon per year. So I want you to think about that number for a second. It's 8 billion tons of carbon in a year. So there are about 7 billion people going towards 8, 7 giga people in a sense, right? Billion people, giga people. So it's kind of like as if each and every one of us uh, during the year, all we did was shoveling coal or carbon from the ground up in the atmosphere and it remains there. It's a ton of carbon for each of us over an entire year. That's the effect of, of uh, anthropogenic emissions. Once they get to the atmosphere though, uh, there are some good news. They don't just, all of, not all of it sits there because we have our friend CO2 fertilization. So CO2 gets absorbed by plants and soil and uh, the biota, but that's about one gigaton only. So we're still left with seven. And then there's the ocean, our biggest uh, help. Uh, three, about three gigatons of carbon a year can go in it. So there's still an imbalance in there of, uh, of about four. So with this very simplified carbon cycle, it's as simple as, as, as it is, you can answer actually some big questions. Like, how long would it take to the oceans, uh, how long would it take for the oceans to remove anthropogenic CO2? And you can actually calculate that just from the carbon cycle. You're looking at the pre-industrial concentration of CO2, 280 ppm, the current one. So you have a difference of 110. You can calculate how many gigatons that is. And you know the fluxes. It'll take 77 years for the ocean to clear that. So if we stopped emitting today, which of course we can't, uh, it will still take 77 years if all we had was the oceans to, to clean it. Now, let's add some more fluxes in here. 
because we can have sedimentation from, from the dead uh, uh, animals and plants. It goes into the rocks. We have calcium carbonate uh, precipitation in the ocean. These are other phenomena that impact carbon in the ocean and, uh, and on Earth. And once we have those, we can actually answer even more important questions. So how much CO2 can potentially the oceans actually uptake at most? Well, it turns out that uh, it's all about a very simple uh, inorganic chemistry reaction. It's about uh, CO2, which is dissolved in the water and becomes a, a biocarb uh, biocarbonate ion and carbonate ion and water. But it boils down to this. For each molecule of CO2, you need a molecule of uh, uh, ca uh, carbonate, CO with two minus. It's a one on one. To take one out, you need one of these. So what you need to know, it's what's the size of the carbonate ion reservoir. And that happens to be relatively small, 1,300 gigatons. Guess how much fossil fuels we have? Well, 4,700 is the size. So it would not be possible for the ocean. It just would not be possible to just rely on ocean to clean up all the carbon that would be burning if we were to burn all the fossil fuels. So the oceans cannot uptake all the CO2 uh, from fossil fuels. Here's another one for you. How long will the anthropogenic CO2 remain in the oceans? Those 77 years, it's going to sit there, uh, but uh, uh, is it just going to sit there? It's just going to be uh, depositing, actually. But that, that removal? is very slow. So it takes 77 years to leave the atmosphere and go into the ocean. And once it's in the oceans, it takes 1,155 years to be removed. And during those years, all the CO2 is going to cause acidification, ocean acidification. So big, big numbers, long times. And uh, the bottom line of this, this first introduction is actually these three numbers. So eight the number of gigatons of carbon from fossil fuels that we're putting into the air, four, what nature does for us, but four is the size of our problem. These four gigatons of carbon that we need to take care of. Very simple calculations. Here's motivation number two. Let's take a look at fossil fuels. And uh, in a very simplified way, uh, the, the characterization of reserves versus resources in fossil fuels and any kind of uh, resource actually, it could be gold or, or other finite resources. You characterize them based on cost. How long, how much does it cost to extract them? Is it cheap or not? And how certain I am of their existence. So in a very simplified way, the least uncertainty is here and the lowest cost, that's what defines a reserve. Everything else has degrees of uncertainty. It can be there, but maybe it's very expensive to extract and so on. So this is a very simplified representation of the issue. The actual issue can be funnily, funny and, and complex. Uh, this is the Oil and Gas Reserves Committee classification of uh, oil. And it can be demonstrated, measured, indicated, inferred, hypothetical, and speculative. And all of those can be divided into par-marginal, sub-marginal, sub-economic, and so on. So my version was much simpler. But the bottom line is still that the reserves are up here. They are a subset of the resources, and that's the important one. The, reser the reserves are the ones that we know with some confidence. So we should focus on the reserves. So how many, how much do we have left? How much do we really have? And I'm going to take some examples uh, here. So this is coal in the US. And uh, um, 2009 is actually the most uh, recent uh, uh, image I could find for the whole picture. But I did look up yesterday the active mine, the reserves at active mines as of 2012 is exactly the same number. So I couldn't check everything else, but this is the same. So it gives you an idea of the size. So the reserves are the tip and the resources is everything else. But the reserves are the ones that we care about the most. So. You can go online, you can go to a bunch of uh, uh, sites, and I usually go to the Energy Information Administration. Uh, it's a US uh, uh, site, I really trust it. And you can look up how much petroleum, natural gas, and coal, how much are the reserves in the world of those. And you can also find data about how quickly we are consuming them. And assuming that that consumption rate remains the same, which it probably won't, as, as more countries develop, the consumption rate, chances are it's going to go up. But you can take the reserves, 
divide by the consumption rate per year, and you get how many years those are going to last. And so these are the most recent data available that have been uh, checked and controlled. And so this is a very nice uh, exercise in class, by the way, for undergraduate students. Uh, you can give them 10 minutes to calculate these numbers. And these are the results. So petroleum will be out in 42, year, in 42 years. The reserves, at least, will be gone. So our economy that relies on petroleum as we have it today, will be done in 42 years. What growth rate did you use? Uh, this consumption rate. That doesn't tell me what the growth is. Well, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So as I said, I'm assuming that it stays constant, so I'm not making that grow. So chances are it's less. But chances are there will be some discoveries too. So I think it's a fair number. So. I happen to be 42 and a half and three quarters years old, <laughs> so <laughs> something like that. So that number is very dear to me because it means that a child born today, when they get to my lovely age, um, they will see a different world that doesn't have all this petroleum and all this cheap energy, all this plastic that we don't think about. It will be very different. And so I'm concerned about my own children. Uh, natural gas, 56. It's not that much longer. Coal, we have a lot of it. But I also have somewhat old, I couldn't find anything uh, uh, newer than that. So our economy is based on something that will run out. Motivation number three. This is where I'm going to put together a lot of stuff. My favorite topic possibly in the world. And it's so beautiful because I can start with something that everybody can understand. How about x equal to x, <laughs> where x in this case is anthropogenic carbon emissions, and we already know what that is, 8 gigatons of carbon per year. I think it's safe to say that the left side of an equal sign uh, is equal to the right side. And it's also fair to say that I can multiply and divide by the same number, and the equality remains. So that's what I'll, I'll keep doing uh, this afternoon. So I'm multiplying those emissions by the energy consumption. So I multiply and divide, but it just so happens that this ratio, carbon emissions over energy consumption, is called carbon intensity. So it's a parameter that tells you how much, how much carbon do I emit for every unit of energy that I produce. And as you can imagine, depending on what uh, energy type you're talking about, you have more or less carbon. So for wind energy, there's no carbon emitted when you're producing the, the kilowatt hours from the turbine. When you're burning coal, there is a lot of CO2 that's being emitted. So that's where the difference is. So I'm going to give you some, it doesn't have to be uh, energy for electricity. I'm going to show you some, uh, some values of carbon intensity by fuel type. You can look at different uh, diesels, bio or non-bio, gasoline, methane, and you can calculate how many grams of carbon dioxide are produced per megajoule of energy. So most of my talk is about carbon, not, not necessarily carbon dioxide, but it's just a factor of four to, to, to take into account. But anyway, it's, it kind of shows you which one of our main uh, fuels produces the most carbon, coal, um, followed by gasoline, diesel, and natural gas. And biodiesels are still producing carbon. So if carbon is what you're focusing on, uh, biodiesel is not the answer. Then guess what? I'm going to take another parameter, GDP, gross domestic product, multiply and divide. And again, I come up with this new parameter. So this is the energy intensity. How much energy do I need uh, to produce a million dollars? Basically, it's just that's like how I think of it. Uh, it's, 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 I'm going to show you what it looks like. Being the ratio of the energy and GDP, it's kind of hard to guess whether it's going up or down uh, because uh, the GDP is growing. That's a good sign. GDP grows, development, and all of that. But obviously, you can't have development without energy consumption. So they're actually both increasing as a function of time. But what matters is their ratio. And the ratio is actually going down, which means that we're being more effective at using our energy to produce money. So. You can actually get this data, and you know it was 100% in 1990. You look at what it is in 2006, it went down by 20%.
you divide by the number of years and you get a decrease of about 1.25% per year. So it's definitely going down. So let's think about 2100. Let's, let's, let's look ahead uh, by 90, uh, where are 2013? <laughs> let's look uh, to the future at uh, 2100. And every plot ends at a different year. So you have but the point is that if this continues by 2100, we will have, we will go down to about uh, 0.3 of what it was in 1990, about a third of what it is today, okay? So I'm gonna come back to all these numbers that I calculate. I'm gonna do the last one, which has to do with people, number of people on Earth. And again, multiply and divide, and guess what? GDP over N, now this is wealth. This is a, the GDP uh, pro, cap, pro capita or per capita. That's how much uh, money is available, how, many, how much money uh, per person there is, and it's an indication of development as well. So how is that, how is that doing? Doing very well. Uh, this is uh, data that I actually downloaded yesterday from the World Bank, and uh, very cool stuff. So as you can see, sometimes there are st uh, periods where there's not much growth, and then it goes up. This is 2009, uh, it definitely did a big uh, uh, drop, uh, but then it seems to be growing at about the same rate as it, as it used to, so it just went down a little bit. Again, you can look at uh, the average growth, and I'm gonna use a very conservative estimate of 2% per year. So it's been going up by about 2% per year. Take that, project to 2100, we have a factor of six. So in 2100, this parameter will go up by a factor of six. Is inflation taken into account? No. So how would the change affect the difference? I have no idea. This is just to make a point uh, very back of the envelope. It's current, uh, US. It's so current US. US. So, so inflation is taken into account. But n not with my calculations when I project it. And does it mean more people are rich? Uh, more people, yes. It means that more people are rich. But when you talk about poverty increasing as per capita, I mean, it doesn't show up in this graph. I mean, that's I'm not sure. That's, uh, uh, let's see if I can make the point, and maybe will be your, your observation will be moot. Hopefully, it, it'll still hold. <laughs> that's, OK? And then the last thing to look at is population trends. So how many people are, are going to be there? And that's, there's a big uncertainty in there. But uh, so the medium projection, which is the blue one, kind of flattens out. And so that's the one I'm using. It seems to be um, likely. And so that means 10 billion people by 2100. So it's only a factor of 1.4 with respect to the beginning of the century. So what I've done very quickly, and I apologize for that, but uh, um, you can redo it yourself. It's really that simple to do. I've basically found a multiplying factor for each of those parameters, and now because they're multiplied together, you multiply those together as well. And so what this tells me is that uh, if I don't even think about the carbon intensity, what a projection, a relatively easy projection, is a factor of 2.5 in the emissions of carbon by 2100. Easily we can expect those to go up. And the only action we can take, I think I have, uh, um, I'm going too far ahead, but uh, the only place where I can really act is this. Why? Because should I really control the number of people? What kinds of, you know, do we want to have a major massacre, you know, kill people so that they don't grow? Of course we don't want to do that. Do you want to tell people how many kids to have? You know, that's, that's, that's not, not, that not easy to do. GDP, wealth, do you really not want people to be wealthier as they can? That's hard to touch. And this one, the energy intensity, uh, has already been improving dramatically. So we're pretty much left only with that carbon intensity. And uh, um, so remember eight, eight gigatons of carbon. Now you take that 2.5, multiply by eight, and we get 20. So now, uh, in 2100, our size is 20, and the, and the, the sinks are not gonna grow. So the ocean and the biota will still take, they're about a saturation right now. So what we're left is 16. 16 gigaton, our carbon problem is twice the size of our energy economy today. And it's four times the size of our current carbon problem. 
So because of all those very simple projections, and there isn't that much we can do, as I was saying, the smart, of course, of course, if this goes to zero, if we can have an energy economy that has no carbon emission, Negative. all of that, <laughs> then we're good, right? And it, 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 negative, I guess, if you would absorb CO2. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that could be uh, another way as well. That's pretty much the only thing we can work on. So a clean economy that we're talking about is a huge challenge because it's 16 gigatons of carbon equivalent. So I'm talking about an economy that is twice as big as the current fossil fuel-based economy, but it's clean. Very, very difficult, very, very challenging problem. Motivation number four, the most important one, and the one that I hope I'll be able to show you. Let's see. Where are you? I think it was uh, always um, misunderstood. People just didn't seem to like me. I think I annoyed them. I got on their nerves. I don't know why. That's just the way it was. myself it's so funny <laughs> and let's see if I can get back to the rest of the talk ah look at that um, so that was a nice transition it's now six years old I think that clip but I still love it and it still makes me laugh so I hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, it's a nice transition now to some more serious topics uh, so I'm gonna start describing to you this saturation concept which I'm going to propose is a, is a way of truly evaluating the potential of wind. So now I've done all this motivation about how important a clean, econ a clean economy is. So we need to go into more renewable energy. Now we don't want to make the same mistake of picking an energy source that is going to run out, right? So it's very important that uh, we can prove that there's enough wind for our needs. And that's where I've done a lot of work on. <coughs> Um, just uh, for those of you who are not familiar with wind turbines, um, they are really big. They are really big machines. Uh, they're typically at about the hub, which is this part here with the nacelle and the generator and uh, uh, all the uh, heavy equipment, is at about 100 meters from the ground. So that's about 300 feet from the ground. And the blades themselves are easily, this one is a 32 meter blade that I am showing you here, and this is a person standing by it. And now they are uh, 65 meters long. They're easily twice as long. They are so long that I don't know if you can tell, this is a truck carrying a blade uh, to a wind farm. And I, if I understand correctly, if the road is winding, 
it's not going to happen. <laughs> you can't deliver the blade if, if the road is too, has too many turns because this thing cannot turn. So, and also, it's tall. And so if there are bridges on your way, there has to be enough space for the, the, the turbine to go. So the true limit to blade size is actually the bridge height. <laughs> What's the shortest uh, height that the highway administration allows their bridges to be? That's as big as the turbine can get, otherwise you can't deliver it. Was there a, was there a hand? No, okay. Um, so I'm also I think it is already rotated in that way. Yeah, you, you can't tell, but uh, yeah, it's already on the in the most favorable position. What's the mass? Of, can't you use heavy lift helicopters to deliver them? Um, I think you can. You probably can. Um, the costs and yeah. all of that. But anyway, offshore they have to be creative in their deliveries, and I've seen all kinds of funky designs where they're, sometimes they're like on a boat and they get turned up, and it, it's challenging. But the advantage, if you take my, my wind power meteorology class, you know that you want the turbines to be as big as possible because you can capture more wind, and then the taller they get, the, the higher the wind becomes. So you have double dipping in a sense. You get more wind and, and uh, a bigger um, swept area. Uh, the technology I'm including are also um, offshore wind, and that's a um, quadrupod uh, jacket. It's not a heavy foundation, and that's the new way that uh, is, is, uh, is booming right now for offshore foundations. It used to be just a regular foundation, you know, cement and heavy. Now that's much lighter, and uh, so it reduces costs. And uh, it allows uh, deeper depths, depths to be reached. So right now, 50 meters is totally within reach. And for deeper than 50 meters, you have to go into some kind of a floating floating turbine and that's a little more expensive and difficult. Um, I'm focusing mostly on horizontal axis turbines but there are also uh, a lot of new designs about vertical axis turbines and those are more like residential applications. They're very pretty. I've seen some in Washington DC in front of uh, the museums so they're small and uh, not, not as efficient perhaps but um, you can pack more of them per um, square kilometer or whatever. So here's the big question for wind. Is there enough wind? Because as I said, we don't want to make the same mistake again. Um, here's like a caution uh, slide in that we can't really compare units of energy with units of, of power because they are two different uh, entities. So for, for coal and petroleum, it's relatively easy to say how many joules there are or, or uh, you know, um, how many, of course, how many tons of coal, I can easily calculate that. But for wind, it's not an energy, it's a flow. So the wind flows and therefore the natural units are power and therefore they're measured in watts, not in energy. So sometimes to make comparisons possible, people do what would be the production in an entire year and so they give you per year how many joules you would produce because once you multiply uh, power times time, you get energy back. But anyway, the natural unit is watts. And uh, so the theoretical, technical and practical potential, I have to be a little boring here. Um, the theoretical wind power potential, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very important. It's kind of like the equivalent of the resources, uh, if you wish, for, for coal and petroleum, not the reserves. The reserves are more like the practical potential. But nonetheless, this one better be big or we're not gonna, we're not gonna uh, tap into wind. And so it's the maximum theoretical power from wind anywhere on earth if there were no limitations. Doesn't, it's not realistic at all. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. Uh, the technical potential now starts assuming some efficiencies. We have to use co contemporary technologies. We're not gonna do it. We're gonna do it typically at 100 meter of hub height. Uh, you know, there's a power curve. We can only produce above a certain threshold, below a certain threshold. You start putting into all those t uh, technological constraints. And then the practical wind power potential, that's more like the reserves that we were talking about. This is the one that includes restrictions with land use. You know, I can't build in all of your houses. Uh, I can't uh, build in, uh, in remote areas, uh, national parks and things like that. Um, so. so in order to calculate these potentials, I'm using modeling, so computer model. This is uh, a, uh, um, 
It's a pretty complete model that uh, has gas, aerosol, transport, climate, ocean, um, general circulation, and I think I said it all, uh, was developed by Mark Jacobson at Stanford. And we ran it at various resolutions um, for about four years, between 2006 and 2009. Depending on which simulation it is, it might be longer or shorter because of computer time. Um, but uh, what we did, we inserted into the model an actual power curve of a turbine. So as an output, not only does it give me wind speed and temperature and all of that, but it also gives me how many gigawatts I would produce at that grid point if I had one turbine. And then, of course, you do manipulation and you say, well, guess what? I'm not going to just put one. I'm going to 7D times 4D is the spacing between them and D is the diameter. So I want to make sure that I don't pack them too much. And so, and then I'm going to use some system losses to calculate uh, all that kind of stuff. We ran it for a bunch of years. And I'm going to give you a snapshot of what the difference between theoretical, technical, and practical would be. And I'm going to kind of go back and forth a little bit. So when I talk about theoretical wind power, I have no limits. I'm going to go in the ocean and tell you how much wind power there is there. I can go to Antarctica and say, oh yeah, look at that. I can have 2,000 uh, watts per square meter of power there. It's theoretical, right? doesn't have limitations. And that's where the technical comes in. It's like, wait a second, we're not going to, well, maybe not yet. We're not going to get wind from the middle of the ocean, so that's gone. I'm not going to go on top of the Himalaya to extract wind power, so that's gone. I'm not going to go to the poles and so on. And, uh, and the, the color scale scheme is the same, actually. And this is now the practical wind power. So now I'm restricting myself to only the windy areas that are really sweet spots for wind and that don't have all those practical, all those, uh, yeah, they actually have those practical limitations. So I'm going to go back and forth, and, and hopefully you will notice how the reds that were dominating here, red mean, meaning a lot of uh, power, it's kind of gone pretty much once you start adding all those restrictions. Um, so now that we know where the power is, how can we sum it all up together, right? We want to know how much power there is. And that's where the dilemma is. You would be tempted to just sum it all together, right? I know how much wind power is here, is here, and I'm going to sum it up, and I'm going to tell you how much that is. And that's what we used to do. <laughs> and then we realized that if you extract power from the atmosphere, that impacts the wind downwind in a certain way. And at first, it really doesn't. But there, there's probably a moment, a saturation point, after which you can't actually get any more out. And so that's what I'm trying to target here. And in order to do this, I have to put it in my model. And the way I do this is a, with a wind turbine parameterization. So how do I pretend that there is a turbine in the model? I have a, a sink of momentum in the model at about 100 meters of height. Uh, and actually, throughout the whole swept area of the turbine, I extract kinetic energy in a way that is proportional to the, to the power extracted. And so I'm actually taking it out of the flow. And then what happens? It becomes electricity, right? And then we transmit it all over, and it becomes heat. That's how it's dissipated. So to, to um, preserve ener conserve energy, all that energy that I extract, I, I bring it to the ground, and it, it's converted to heat, because that's what really happens. And, uh, and so uh, I'm putting up this, this, this uh, slide just to describe the br very briefly the differences that we got uh, with doing it our way, which is the, the left panel, versus doing it with a surface parameterization, which is what most people have done. They've simply increased the roughness of the surface in order to simulate the presence of turbines. And, and the problem is that that way, you tend to overestimate the extraction of wind speed near the ground. It's, it's too high, and it's not high enough aloft. So, so we did this, and we started first with some realistic scenarios, and nothing happened, nothing happened. And then we put turbines more and more and more. And we actually did some runs with 6,000 terawatts of installed capacity. So 6,000 terawatts is, is, is so high. The consumption of humanity right now is two. So 6,000 terawatts versus two. So this is not in any way realistic, or I don't even think we have cement 
to build this, this 6,000 terawatts, okay? It's a, one of those funny, fun things that you can do with a model, but it doesn't mean, it's not realistic, it's an exercise. And so what we wanted to see, at first, as I was saying, this is the installed power, and this is the power you actually get. And the, the dashed line is what you would get if you were just to sum up all those grid points without considering the feedbacks. And at first, everything was very linear, like, oh, wow, we're really, you know, we're not impacting the climate at all. And then you had to reach that saturation point, which happens to be at about 250 terawatts of extraction, after which, look at this, from this point, I have some 2,000, some 2,000 terawatts of installed power. From here to here, I go up by 50%. I put 1,000 more terawatts of turbines, and I get nothing extra like a tiny, tiny bit extra. Whereas here, of course, if I go from zero to a thousand, I get a completely different scenario. So there is a saturation point on Earth. And uh, that, my claim is that that should really be the theoretical wind power potential because that's the limit if you stay below which um, wind is truly renewable. It means that it comes back to you the year later with the same potential. Whereas if you try to extract more than that, you can't. So that's the, the theoretical wind power potential. And, and the global run blue here means turbines everywhere. I mean, oceans, you name it, everywhere. But then we've, look, we've looked at what happens uh, if we put them only over land. And then I have some runs, I don't think I have them here. Um, for what happens if we put them only on windy spots. And that's basically we are down here and there's no, um, no effect. Yes? Do you base this on a coarse resolution model? Um, the finest was 1.5 uh, degrees. So do, these, do these curves scale with the resolution? They do, they do. In fact, uh, this one is already scaled. <laughs> so uh, do I have a, I don't think I have a slide, yeah. So if you stay on a coarser resolution, you get, actually I have a slide later and you'll see the difference and yeah. So here's the claim that this is truly the theoretical wind power potential. And again, to put things in perspective, uh, two terawatts is the current uh, global electricity demand. So. The bottom line is there is plenty of wind. It's a good energy source to tap into. That, now, what if we want to look at the potential? This is theoretical, like, but the practical potential. Then there's a bunch of assumptions that um, I'm actually going to skip. And I'm going to show you the effect of the grid, the resolution, as well as the effect of seasonality, which is another finding that I thought was kind of cool. Um, if you're looking at the entire world, right? Uh, northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, you know, one has a winter, one has the summer, and you know, the, the, there's like a complementarity in the two seasons that uh, I thought was gonna make my potential somewhat flat as a function of time. Um, but it turns out it's not, and this is what the diagram is kind of showing you. There's definitely much higher potential in the winter, in the northern hemisphere's winter, than there is in the summer, and that's because of the distribution of land. So since I was focusing on land-based turbines or near-shore turbines, um, it's definitely dominated by the northern hemisphere cycle. Um, also, it has, um, We've ran various resolutions, as I was saying, and there's a big jump between 4, four by 5 and 2 by 2.5. But with the 1.5 degrees by 1.5 degrees uh, run, we were converging already with the 2 by 2.5. So I, I think the results are somewhat stable now with, with, with um, the grid resolution. And, uh, um, well, let's skip this one. Okay, now this is the neatest thing. Um, it's, it's a natural step, right? So we've looked at the extraction of uh, kinetic energy from the climate, let's say, from the Earth uh, um, at, at a large scale. And in those simulations, there are no hurricanes. You, you're kind of doing an average climate. Um, and then like, it, it, we're, we're thinking, okay, if we're slowing down the winds a little bit, can we can we get a benefit off of that? So what would happen if we had offshore farms along the, uh, along the US East Coast and in the Gulf of Mexico, 
what would happen during a hurricane? We know that turbines probably don't survive. T today, they wouldn't survive. There, are, there aren't really turbines that can survive hurricane uh, winds. Um, but let's pretend that th they do. Let's pretend that they can. Can they potentially slow down the hurricane? That's the big question. And so we, use, we happen to have this fabulous parameterization that we had already done. And uh, so we now focused on two hurricanes, Katrina and Sandy. And uh, we pretended that, that there were offshore wind farms on a strip of, of ocean about 100 kilometers from the coastline, everywhere. The spacing is the same as we did before. And uh, uh, so I'm going to show you some results of what happens. And this is for Katrina. So this is wind speed at 15 meters above, above ground. It's the lowest model level with no turbines. So this is the control case. And this is a case in which we have the turbines. So I know you were expecting that there would be no hurricane. There, there is still a hurricane, okay? Hurricane is, is an incredibly powerful engine, so we're not gonna make it go away. But if you please focus on the strip of land, so this is bathymetry and uh, you know, 0, 10, uh, 30, 50. The turbines are, pre are 100 kilometers from the coast. So look at here, the color here, is green, which corresponds to about 20 meters per second winds. With turbines, the color is blue, which corresponds to five meters per second winds. So offshore of New Orleans, we've reduced the winds from 20 to some five to 10 meters per second, okay? That's a 15 meters per second reduction. The maximum reduction we got in Katrina, I think, was 25. Now we're talking. That has a huge impact on storm, storm surge. It's directly proportional to the square of the wind speed. We get reduction in storm surge by 70%. We're not flooding New Orleans. And guess what? Even the uh, sea level pressure in the core of the hurricane goes up. This is the difference in pressure. And it goes up by, you look at the darkest color, this is eight. Uh, millibars and I think the maximum was 17 millibars at the highest time so still whatever the category was I don't remember but the turbines take energy out from the outer side uh, outer uh, parts of the hurricane and it actually fills up so it's not as deep as it was unbelievable and meanwhile you produce power terawatts of power terra that terra you know, one terawatt is half humanity, just from these strips, just from, this is the, the, um, the difference in wind speed. So it kind of shows you exactly where the turbines are. Sandy wasn't as exciting, um, <laughs> but still had the same kind of benefits. That's the case with no turbines, and you see all the greens and the yellows near the coast. And uh, uh, what is it? With turbines, it's green as opposed to there's less yellow, basically. So we get a more modest reduction. But we also had less turbines than with Katrina. And we're still, and uh, apparently, um, I'm not a hurricane expert, but Sandy was such a hybrid mixed storm that uh, chances are we didn't get it right in the first place. It's very hard to simulate. It was a hybrid between a nor'easter and a hurricane. And in fact, I don't know if you've ever seen a hurricane with the maximum winds in the south. That, I thought it was like crazy, but that's what it was. It had highest winds in the, to the south of the eye than to the, in the northeast sector. Um, but again, we got reductions there, and this is the difference in wind speeds, and they tend to be in the blues and the light blues, which are negative values, so reductions in general. So this hurricane taming thing seems to be working, but uh, right now it's just an academic exercise. We have just put a lot of turbines without paying any attention to shipping lanes or uh, you know, whether the geology uh, was favorable or not, uh, no attention to costs, of course. In the little detail, we assumed that the turbines were operating flawlessly and they had no problems, right? So uh, all of this is, is my proposal that I just submitted today. So hopefully we're going to look at all those other issues. Um, but we already had some kind of interesting twists. One is that local arrays provide local protection. And uh, 
In other words, you don't need to cover the entire coast uh, to protect New Orleans. You can protect New Orleans by putting turbines in front of New Orleans. So it's very good to have a plan that protects the city by acting on the city. It's very hard to tell New York, you know what, to protect New Orleans, you have to spend millions of dollars <laughs> to, to protect New Orleans. You know, it, 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 it's hard, but it's actually a local effect. And uh, um, of course, higher rated turbines have higher benefits. So if you have to choose between a small one and a big one, pick the big one because it extracts more energy from the, from the hurricane. And then we did a little bit of some tests about, we actually assumed, right now the turbines are cut off at 25 meters per second, which was close to the maximum speeds that we, we were seeing uh, in, the, in the locations of interest for the storms. But um, there were, all, of course, locations with much higher speeds than that. So what if the turbines could actually be made stronger so that they can actually operate past that cutoff speed? And we found that for the cases that we looked at, just Katrina and Sandy, it, it was good, but it wasn't dramatic. It wasn't a dramatic difference. So, um, but I'm going to look into that in more detail. Do I have until 3.30? Maybe five more minutes. Five more minutes? Okay, you guys. I, I have to show you something about airborne wind energy or I wouldn't be myself. So I'm just going to skip to a couple of cute uh, photos. Uh, airborne wind energy is about reaching higher altitudes where the winds are higher without needing a foundation, without, without needing all that heavy structure that comes with traditional turbines. And it can be done with something that is closer to a kite than it is to a turbine. And that's what these designs are. This is a kite that might be in, in at most 100 meters in length, and it can be launched into the wind, and it, it can be forced to make an eight shape. It's an upside down eight. And by doing that in the as ascendant, in actually in the descendant phases, in three quarters of the path, the speed that that thing reaches are eight times the speed of the wind. So they can reach very high speeds, therefore very high power, because they make a, uh, the generator, because there are two cables, uh, that, that, that movement makes the generator spin at the ground. And this is a, a turbine that is actually in, uh, inserted into this helium filled balloon. So it's a traditional turbine, but it's just, it can go higher without needing a foundation. These are turbines that are mounted on a helicopter like structure, and there's a tether that connects it. All of these are tethered, obviously. And this one has very small uh, propellers. So the turbines are very small, but there are lots of them. And, uh, and that too makes, the, it actually makes a circular path in the air. So let's see if I can show you Makani.
<laughs> the music to the region. <laughs> you local. Right. Let's see if I have this one. Yeah, whatever your indigenous people like. <laughs> This one doesn't have the link. Oh well. And, Let's see if I like the kite this one. Uh, when it crashes. I guess crash. my links are gone. <laughs> once it works once it doesn't work. Um, so it, it, it's a success story I call it. Uh, is this the light? No? Oops. No, okay. No. Um, it's a very new field of research and uh, there are a few startups more and more every year. And they're finally, finally getting together in conferences that are uh, happening uh, every year. And uh, I'm very proud to say that the first time I organized it, and it was in 2009 in Chico, and it, it was so interesting because these comp startups, right, very competitive, and they have their patents and their designs, and they, they're all very creative and innovators uh, that are doing that. And they're really thinking they're going to change the world. They're not going to give away their details. They're not going to tell you how their turbine works after they spent six years collecting funds and you know getting some prototype working. And then finally, they decide to get together this conference. They accept the invitation. They come, and they have like half of their slides. All of them have the same, the same stuff. Like you know, we need a tether that is lighter. Uh, we need uh, uh, permits to fly. We need uh, safety. We need to make sure that our devices are safe. The same concept over and over. Finally, they're like, huh? Maybe we shouldn't all of us be working together independently, but rather get together. And they founded uh, the consortium, the Airborne Wind Energy Consortium. And now they're having regular conferences. And this next year, I'm very excited because it will be in Berlin. I'm from Italy. Berlin is like around the corner for me. So it's a very good excuse to go home. And, uh, and it will be a week before the election in Germany. And apparently in Germany, a week before the election, politicians may not have any advertisement on TV. So they cannot run their ads. So what they do is they go to any kind of event that is uh, broadcast anyway. So they, they're not advertising. They just happen to be at Britney Spears concert or they happen to be at the Airborne Wind Energy Conference. <laughs> and so we're going to have three prototypes, I believe, in Berlin if they can manage to deliver them to the stadium. And it will be some kind of a kite um, event for the whole population of Berlin. And the chances are the prime minister will come or something like that. So I'm very thrilled uh, about it. I, I can stop here. I'm going to leave the, maybe the motivations are even more important than the, the conclusions uh, because that's what I hope to leave you with an impression, uh, with, with an impression of how important it is to work on these, these concepts. Thank you very much. Very much questions. Could you re repeat the question sure. for them and for the audience? In the modeling experiment looking at hurricanes, what wind turbine density did you use? How close to that? The question was about what density of turbines was used in the hurricane simulations. And we looked at two uh, spacing. One was 7D by 4D, which is somewhat of a dense uh, array distribution. And then we doubled it, so twice as space, so 50, 60 square. So yeah, much, well, much uh, broader. Roughly what density is used today? Um, in Europe, 7D by 4D is very common, but in the US <coughs> for the offshore projects that I'm involved with, we're looking at 8D by 8D. So it, it, it's, it's in, in that range. Yeah. But it's the number of turbines that is very high in our simulations because we put them everywhere. So Enrique? Uh, yeah. So in your hurricane simulation, do you also affect the path of the hurricane? Is that the intent? Because I can see how much fun you could have if you heard it like to like deflect the hurricane. <laughs> the question was whether in the hurricane simulations the path was affected as well as the other properties of the hurricane. A little bit, not that much. So we can have even more fun trying to do that. Uh, I mean, we're stoked. I, I'm, I'm like, I'm very excited about this, that we can actually reduce the speeds. The path was about the same. I was trying to calculate the landfall time, and it was maybe half an hour difference. So the path is about the same. Then, um, yeah. I heard from some people in the Midwest that there's some type of an annoyance factor living in a house 
nearby a large windmill. Could you speak to that? Is anything to that or not? The question was about rumors that a wind turbine near your house would have a no noise issue. Either noise or vibration. Or, or vibration. Light, um, yeah. Um, I can talk about this for an hour uh, because I lived by, <laughs> by one. Um, I would say each of us is different and what bothers you might not bother me and what, bo what bothers me might not bother you. So it's very hard to give you an answer that um, applies to everybody. Um, wind turbines have to be built with distances from, from homes. So uh, I'm, I'm, I know something about this because my university has a turbine that we just installed in Lewis in Delaware and there is a minimum distance of one kilometer, I think 1100 meters from the nearest house. And uh, our university has a hotel, uh, a guest house, which is 400 meters from the turbine where guests sleep. And I happen to actually have slept in it. And yes, you hear the turbine, but I hear the crickets way more than I hear the turbine. So I slept like a rock, no problem at all. The house that is two kilometers away, they say that they can sleep at night. It's a personal, I think it's a personal judgment. Uh, yeah, what can I say? But there are laws about how far they have to be, and uh, so they, they couldn't be built too close anyway. So that's all I'm going to say for now. I hope it gives you a perspective. So it's really a personal issue. It doesn't matter maybe if the decibel noise is very low. If it bothers you, it bothers you. And I, I tend to believe that it does. Uh, so. So the question was uh, about uh, whether other effects of slowing down the winds were observed aside from the hurricane case. A very good question. So uh, the hurricane case is interesting because, um, because you extract so much power and the speeds are so high that you can actually impact a large area. When you have lower wind speeds, like on a regular day or even on a regular storm, the wake of the farm is not that large, so the impacts tend to be very local. So you don't, you don't get that much of an impact downwind. So I would say that actually the effect is probably negligible on, on other days. But I do want to look at the effects on a nor'easter, for example, because nor'easters can be as powerful as hurricanes, if not even more powerful. And when, once the speeds get up there, <laughs> once we have those big wind speeds, that's where I expect the, the, the impact to be higher. For regular wind speeds, it, no, not really. Uh, so uh, with the projected next generation, very large diameter mm -hmm. uh, blade sizes, first, what kind of, what's the power output that you're anticipating? And second, when you look at the AWEs, even if uh, projected to scale, what would be the anticipated power output? So the question was, uh, how big are turbines today? Basically, what's their output uh, of the biggest ones? And uh, what's the output of, uh, by comparison of the airborne uh, correspondence? So right now, I would say, so the highest rated turbines I've seen on the market is 7.5 megawatts. So um, we have used it for the Katrina simulations. So we've used the 5 megawatts and 7.5 megawatts. Uh, those are very large. So a 7.5 megawatt turbine can probably power a small town. Um, so, and, and the size is about 120 meters in diameter. So they're very big. So that, that's about the size. Uh, in terms of airborne wind energy, they want to get up there as well in terms of rated power. So uh, I actually had a link to an interview that I just did. And uh, Basically, because of the size of the energy problem that I mentioned earlier, if you really want to propose a new technology that changes the world <laughs> and all you produce is a few kilowatts, you know, it's not really going to make a dent into the terawatts that we need. So uh, being able to scale up is very important and that's what the Airborne Energy is trying, uh, Consortium is trying to do. So not only do we want to have one kite that produces enough for your refrigerator, we want to have arrays of kites that now can power communities and uh, maybe even scale higher. Um, I, uh, there are a lot of projects that want to go offshore 
and so have these large arrays of kites that just fly offshore. So even if they fall, which they won't, but if they, they did fall, they wouldn't hurt anybody. They wouldn't fall on property or on you know, a school or anything like that. Um, so the, the dream of the airborne wind energy is definitely to go into the megawatt size uh, devices and then have arrays of them. down and that will actually affect the economic feasibility of uh, the whole oh energy uh, system. So, I mean, I was just wondering what is the fragility of yeah. uh, economic fragility of generating yeah. So the question refers to papers that came out a few years ago that, that proved that wind speed has been decreasing over continental U.S. Well, this uh, was more about looking at the future. Yeah, and so the question was, is that going to Im have implications about the wind energy resource? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, so here's another fact for you. So wind, wind speeds over the oceans have been increasing. So if you're talking about land-based winds, then maybe it's negatively impacted. Uh, offshore wind is positively impacted. Um, so that's, that's um, one interesting fact. When I was reading that literature myself, it's a couple of years ago, so it's not super fresh in my mind, but we were talking about variation in a centennial scale that were less than 10% of the seasonal variation of wind. So even uh, the, the trend of wind speed you're talking about is very, very small. And uh, it really manifests itself over some 100 years kind of scale. And at most it's 10% of the average fluctuation between summer and winter. So it's not, I, I, I mean, of course everything has an impact nowadays. Uh, if you can increase the, your farm's production even by 5%, it converts in, into millions of dollars. So of course it has an impact. But I would say of all the problems with integrating wind into the grid, uh, you know, developing offshore wind power technologies and airborne, that's not a big concern.